The Football Pod on Off The Ball in partnership with AIB. Proud sponsors of the Football, Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest. Hello there and you're very welcome along to episode 10 of The Football Pod. It's the business end of the league. Paddy Andrews, you're very welcome. Good to see you, T. James, nice to be back with you. Thanks, Tom. Good to see you. I have a fairly simple question to kick it off here. Are you enjoying the football so far in 2023? James, I'll go to you first. I am because any week it's not on is a week you'd miss it. But if you actually take all the games, the quality probably isn't as high as you'd like. I think that this time of year, and it's been exemplified this year, it's more about digging out a result by any means necessary rather than playing great football. Uh, Whereas come the summer, I think the play will be faster. It'll suit the better players more. But at the moment, I think there is a bit of slogging going on and we're not seeing great football. I think it's fair to say that. Then again, it's still intriguing. But in terms of quality, it probably is down a bit. Paddy, you were a summer baller, weren't you? I usually was better in the summer, yeah, than the National League. Um, have you enjoyed massive it? Different, massive difference between it the is, two. It is. It really is. Like Crow Park in the summer compared to, like, you know, I've mentioned this before, the likes of Castlebar in February. It's nearly like a different sport, particularly in the full forward it line. Um, and, and look, there's nothing new in that regard. The National League, it's unbelievably competitive across all the divisions. You see it every weekend. Games are so close across the board. There's none of these kind of non-event matches where teams are being beaten with 20 points that you do see in some of the provincial championship games early on in the summer. So the competition and the competitive competitiveness of the games is still there, which is good. But conditions don't make it easy. Um, and I, I agree with James. We haven't really seen free-flowing, high-scoring games in the National League. You look at some of the big games that are televised that you're looking forward to, the nice the Armagh Kerry game, the Dublin Derry game in recent weeks. They're close games, but they're probably not the most exciting games, I feel, just in terms of quality, in terms of scores and things like that. So that's, that, that's normal. That does come later in the summer. But I agree with James. It, it, it's definitely interesting. You could see that. And the Jekyll and Hyde nature of some of the performances from some of the teams um, is interesting week to week. Um, but we are getting a real sense of who are going to be the front runners and riders come summertime now that we're into the last week of games. So I have enjoyed bits of it, but I, I do think as conditions become more favourable um, coming into the summer, I'm hoping for a little bit more quality in some of the top games, definitely. I think, yeah. it, is, I think it is full forward lines that see the biggest difference like I was just saying to you before we came on there, last week we saw Khan O'Callaghan probably for the first time get the ball, look at his man in the eyes and be able to just dance around him because there was a bit of firmness in the ground. Mm. But like that's pure summer. Like you don't see much of that kind of in the in the start of the National League. So like you'd be hoping that come the summer we'll see loads of ball being kicked in, fellas taking on their men, going around them, using the firm ground because it's so hard to go around your defender when the ground is soft. So once it hardens up, I'd, I'd imagine the full forward line quality will skyrocket. 100%. But even you look at the games on Sunday, the two televised games, up in Bally Buffet uh, and a clown us for the Monaghan Tyrone game. The conditions are still hard, lads. If you're on the yeah. full forward line, there's gale force winds in every match, <laughs> which is, yeah. we've seen that in Navin on Saturday for Dublin and Mead as well. So I, I do actually, it's funny you mentioned that I think the full forward lines are the, are the lines that. They're, they find it hardest to kind of stand out throughout the spring. For the most. Yeah, exactly. We, we just get a raw deal. <laughs> numbers, <laughs> numbers 13 to 15. But but um, but still, like this weekend is obviously very interesting as, as the league's climax and we get a handle on the, the finals the following weekend in Crow Park and then we're into April, you know. So the clocks go forward. <laughs> we're into the championship just around the corner as well. So like I say, it's been, an, it's been a very interesting league because of the competitiveness of it. But I think quality-wise, we should start seeing it to ramp up again um, as conditions start to improve in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, Jekyll and Hyde described it as there. And I think there's a lot of counties in that boat. Mm. When we look at, um, you know, the the kind of record so far, Derry, six wins from six, obviously are the form team in the country. Mayo are also unbeaten, two draws early on and four wins since. So they've been impressive. 
you know, uh, Sligo going quite well. They're in a shootout now for a promotion with Leitrim and the final game next week. The Dubs have obviously only had one defeat. Fermanagh have been one of the stories of the league so Ooh. far. They have a great chance now next weekend if they beat Cavan to go up to Division 2 again. Loud though. Loud are one of the stories of the year, lads. And yeah. do you know what? There's been a bit of controversy in the county. Um, I've taken a bit of flack. I don't know if you... You've seen them, but I've, I've been doing the power rankings on off the ball since Owen Sheehan left. And I've been getting a lot of heat for having Westmead higher than loud this year. Now, I did it by virtue of the fact that Westmead won the Tatch and Cup last year. I thought Ooh. to get a bit of a bounce. Loud were coming into Division 2 for the first time. I'm 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 doing them again tomorrow. And loud fans, tune in because uh, I may have now some good news for you. For Sam now, aren't they? <laughs> Not that they're favourites for Sam, but, you know, come Hang on. on last, year, last year, you tipped him. Very highly. Leicester. I think you tipped them for Leinster last year. I, I, may, like my... I may have now, but I, I will say one thing for the people allowed. Fear not, because you may be at war with RTE for the fact that they're refusing to broadcast your games in RD. <laughs> well, Paddy Andrews is taking a stand for you this week because he's sick of having no footage allowed to work on. Paddy is going to watch Loud this Sunday in Crow Park. Isn't that right, Paddy? All the way to Crow Park, he's gone. All, All the way, way to Crow Park to watch Loud. <laughs> I get the expenses in for that one. Now, I'm looking forward to it, actually. It's not what I expected from the final game in Division 2, that this is a head-to-head shootout. But that's testament to Loud and what they've done. Slowish start. Um, but they've got some big wins along the way. Obviously, beating Mead and Kildare, Leinster rivals. Um, and then beating Cork at the weekend. And to be fair, the Cork had, again, very similar, slow enough start, obviously a bit of a disaster, the opening day against me, but they'd got a bit of momentum behind them. But for Loud and for Mickey Hart, if they beat Dublin on Sunday, it would be three promotions in a row. Has that happened before? A team going straight from Division 4, 3, 2, and into Division 1? I, 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 I don't think so. I think it, it shows incredible progress. Um on the flip side, you're looking at Westmead, um, and we we spoke with with Jason Sherlock um, pre Christmas, or Ray Cannell, and obviously one of their star players um, on the back of their Talta Cup success last year. And I have been a little bit underwhelmed with Westmead. I expected them to, I expected them and Cavan to be promoted from Division Three, and they've slipped up a couple of surprise defeats. Means they're staying in Division Three for the year, which is, I'm sure, disappointing for them. I would have expected Westmead to come mm-hmm. up. But if you're looking w- wider across the whole Leinster province, Kildare, and we've touched on them over the last couple of weeks, they got a win at the weekend, so their, their Division 2 status is safe. But they have been, I think we said it, one of the most surprisingly poor performers of across all the divisions. Made the renaissance under Colin O'Rourke seems to have stalled most certainly over the last couple of weeks. You would say for loud, they have put their hands up as one of the top teams in Leinster, what, what they've done over the last month. Um, and it's a brilliant test for them and for Mickey Hart on Sunday that they go to Crow Park to play Dublin in a game that means something for both teams. Like Dublin will have to win that game. It's not a case of rolling out um, kind of squad players and things like that, which some counties have the luxury of doing this weekend with the final round of the game. So I think it's a really good game. I'm looking forward to going into the game. And like you say, getting a proper look at Loud because what they've done over the last month, they have been one of the stories across all four divisions. And it's testament to their progress over the last two seasons under Mickey Hart. Absolutely. And they're actually, they're doing this the minute without some of their key players. Kieran Byrne, who would have been an absolutely unbelievable footballer at Sigerson level and underage for Loud, went off to Australia for six years as a professional, is back. He's been plagued with injuries. I was at their game against Clare and he went down in the first five minutes with a cruciate. They lost him that day. Mickey Hart had to make three Injury and four substitutions in the first half that day. Three injury and four substitutions against Mead a couple of weeks later. Samuel Roy, their talisman, is gone with a hamstring injury for the rest of the league. We're talking about the wee county here. <laughs> They're probably the smallest pick uh, alongside maybe a Monaghan or a Leitrim. And they're managing to pull it out of the fire every single week. It's unbelievable going. Louder doing this. And they're digging deep into their panel. But one thing is clear from listening to uh, Kieran Burns speaking earlier this week. He talks about the work that Mickey Hart has done as a manager and Gavin Devlin as the coach mm. and the fact that they all believe in the system that they're playing. It's so clear the way they're playing. Mm. You would have noticed uh, a clip doing the rounds on Twitter of their goalkeeper, who was a former midfielder, James Calliff, fielding a ball in around midfield. Well, louder employing that same kickout press throughout the year. All year they're doing that. Where last year they were conceding kickouts in every game. So for a team to be that cohesive and have their game plan spot on, I'll tell you one thing. Dublin probably had the easiest warm-up 
for this game last weekend in, in Navin. They had it all their own way. I don't think Loud will give it to them the way Mead did the last day. Mead set up. We'll get into it a little later. Was incredibly naive. Yeah, and look, that's what Mickey Hart, like Mickey Hart and Gavin Devlin going into the layout setup. They're coming from one of the top setups in the country where competing for Ulster Championships and all Ireland titles. So they're at a, a certain level where their game plan, their structures, their analysis, their mentality towards games is of the highest standard. We, we spoke at length, I suppose, and in 2021 when Mickey Hart finally stepped away from that throne gig, where I think it was just the right time for the throne players, the supporters for Mickey Hart after the goes of 20 years being in charge and the success he had, that it was just right for a change. Throne go on and win the All Ireland, so it was justified bringing in Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar. But for Mickey Hart to go straight into Loud, a, a team at the time in Division Four, you know, he's obviously with the expertise and experience he has and the likes of Devlin coming in with him, they're obviously going to have a positive impact straight away because they're just, their mentality is competing for All Ireland. So that is immediately going to have a positive impact on a group struggling in Division Four. And what they've done, I think the speed of their progress to to jump up and be winning one game away from being promoted to Division One is incredible. Um, but that organisation, their style of play being very difficult to break down, being so well organised, that doesn't surprise me at all with the Mickey Hart team. Um, and it's even, like I say, even more impressive that they mightn't have the biggest depth. They don't have the biggest depth in terms of the top teams, but they're still getting results. Um, so... I agree. I think they will be far harder for Dublin to break down this coming Sunday than Mead work. Um, but that's two years of work under Mickey Hart, whereas Mead have to go to two months of work under Colm O'Rourke. So Loud is just far further down their, uh, their line of progress than, than Mead are. And yeah. I think it's a good game for Dublin as well, as, a, as, a, as much as it's a good game for Loud as well on Sunday. I think, yeah. I think that like we spoke about managers going in and kind of getting a bounce before and that chance to kind of get the group and get their attention straight away. But like those load lads must have seen this managerial God almost come in <laughs> and they're, they're clinging on to every word he's saying. And if you have that kind of that blind faith, you can go anywhere with it. Do you know what I mean? Like they're probably, they're seeing Mickey Hart, no matter what he's saying, they're saying we're going with it and we're going with it together. And that kind of siege mentality and that buy-in and that leadership is, you can't buy it. And like that's that's why they've they've created this momentum, gone up and up and up. Whether they'll beat Dublin, look, they probably won't, but it's still been a brilliant league for them. They're still probably one of the stories of the league. Um, it, it but if be. they can kind of keep it, if they can keep it, if they can keep a good game with Dublin for an hour, then I think that it'll be a fantastic that's a thing, Jimmy. We're talking, we spoke about it last week with Donegal. Like a manager like Mickey Hart is a legend. And no matter what county he goes into, and okay, might not have finished as, as he would have liked in Tyrone, but he's a GAA icon. He goes in, if Mickey Hart was coming in coaching me, I would be mad for all to impress this yeah. fella. 100%. Same. And you're looking at Donegal, if McGuinness goes back in there, he is the same sort of aura where you you're, like you've said it to me, you're hanging on every word. Mm -hmm. For Loud to get Mickey Hart is a brilliant coup for them at the time, and it gets the rewards of it. But guys like this, where they have a, a CV that's been built up like that, uh, an aura about them, an iconic status, it's no surprise that you get a big bounce like that. And that's Donegal missing out on someone like McGuinness coming in, and you've seen how they've struggled. And the weekend, again, as, as predicted, it's they've been relegated, but Mickey Hart has a similar type of presence and it's no surprise that he's got this bounce out loud as well. So yeah. It's a, it's, it's a powerful thing when a coaching team and a group connect and they're aligned in the same direction. I'm sure you've both seen it in your own clubs, counties, uh, when you've had success, like the loud lads, what they're saying is like the Mickey overviews everything and Gavin Devlin is the coach and the two lads work in tandem with each other. But just to read something that Kieran Burns said this week, Gavin Devlin, we call him horse. What he has done to our players and how he's instilled confidence is second to none. I've had a lot of coaches in my time in Gaelic football and Aussie rules and Gavin sees the game like no one else. I honestly believe we have one of the best coaches in Ireland. These loud lads are bulletproof at the minute. Mm -hmm. But even if, even if that's not the case, just the fact that they believe that he's the yeah, best coach 100%, yeah. is, is unbelievably powerful. Then if the fact that he is as well, 
is an extra is the cherry on top. But once you get that buy in, no matter what he says in training, we are doing that to the best of our ability. And whatever he says, we're taking it onto the field. Like that's the buy in that sometimes coaches, if there's any bit of doubt, they don't get that. Mm. But you look at we, we we Paddy Talia last year, he came on the show, brilliant guy, a brilliant coach, and the impact he had in Kerry as well. The manager, the figurehead is important, obviously. But having guys, and I agree with James, even if Gavin Devlin is a terrible coach, which he's obviously not, but the fact that his players and the team he's working with mm-hmm. can say that about him, that just shows the, the buzz and the atmosphere and the energy around that camp as well. And it's, it's so, so important getting those decisions right. You've seen, you look at Limerick, for example, the Ray Dempsey situation where it doesn't work out and that atmosphere isn't there and see how quickly it can go wrong. Mm-hmm. And picking the right manager and the manager having the right people around them. Um, it's, it's no secret, not just in Gaelic games, in any sporting team that's successful, there's a connection between the manager, the coaches, the players. You use the word, Tommy, alignment. Loud seem to have that. Um, and, and they, not they seem to have, they do have it because you wouldn't have done what they've done over the last 24 months, mm. back-to-back promotions, in with a show for a third promotion in a row at the weekend, if you don't have that type of atmosphere in the camp. Um, yeah. And that's why, when I mind RTE, I'm going in myself with my own two eyes <laughs> to have a look on Sunday uh, to watch the lads, the Dublin team against Loud. Really interesting game. Um, and just one of quite a few interesting games as the leagues come to a close over, over the weekend. Yeah, we are going to get into the football in a couple of minutes' time. We're going to look at some of the key games that matter in Division 1, Division 2, and we're going to set the scene for Division 3 and 4. We're going to do our predictions for the last time in the league. The Football Pod is brought to you every week by AIB, proud sponsors of the Senior Football Championship. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Uh, we are coming to you a day late this week on the Football Pod. Um, James, uh, you've had a very tough week in Clarny this week. Uh, unfortunately, you've lost a very important club member, Breda Walsh. You might just want to... Yeah, um, yeah, we had a very tough day yesterday. Um, we lost Breda, who is Legion stalwart. Um Herself and her husband Enda would be very close personal friends of mine, two huge Clarny people, two huge Legion people. Um, Brida was just the nicest, most fun person you can imagine. She leaves behind two, two fabulous girls, two daughters, um, Amy and Rebecca. They're two great Legion girls as well. Um, Enda, her husband, is one of the biggest driving forces in the Legion, and he was actually getting Legion Club Person of the Year on Friday night. So I know that Brida was buzzing for that and to be celebrating with everyone and taking the mic and having the crack, you know, it would have been it would have been a great night. Um, I suppose we just want to let Brida's family and especially Enda and the two girls, Amy and Rebecca, just know that we're we're thinking of them and we're here for anything they need. Um, she'll be sorely missed. You are very welcome back to episode 10 of the Football Pod. We're heading into the final round of league action this week. Just to let you know how Division 1 is looking. Mayo are in the league final. Donegal have pretty much been relegated. I'll come back to that in a second. If Galway be Kerry this week, they will join Mayo in the league final. After that, it gets a bit complicated. Galway, Kerry, Tyrone, Roscommon all have a shout of making that league final. And on the other end of the table, Monaghan, Armagh, Tyrone, Roscommon and Kerry can all go down. When I said there's an asterisk beside Donegal, Donegal need to beat, they need to win their game, they need a result to go their way, and they need a monstrous swing and score difference. So I think it's safe to say that Donegal are essentially relegated. If two of us come and Kerry and Tyrone win this week, score difference will decide the finalist. Uh, Galway and Kerry are in the best position for score difference at the minute. So uh, that's the way that's looking. And uh, Armagh need a result to be safe or a draw. Um because it'll beat Monaghan on the head-to-head. Monaghan are up against it in Casabar against Mayo. So that's the way the lay of the land is looking, lads. Um, Tyrone Armagh is going to be a very, very interesting game. It's got um, a lot on the line. It's a local rivalry. Uh, Tyrone can go up. They can also go down. Armagh cannot make the league final, but they can be relegated if things go against them. So uh, I suppose we might start there. Tyrone, after the... Sorry, performance they put on in Castle Bar have turned it around somewhat and have had two strong wins now in the bounce. Paddy, you were watching them against Monaghan. 
are you impressed by elements of their game over the last couple of weeks? Yeah, look, we, we touched on them in depth last week with their win over Kerry. If you look back to, I suppose, the the lowest ebb for this Tyrone team was that the hiding they got in Castle Bar that night. And it was just like watching. It wasn't any Tyrone team that I would have recognised or myself or James would have played against. They were just so porous, so easy to play against. There was no edge in them, whatever, but offensively how poor they were, but defensively they were just wide open. So that was... We were wondering, could they get a response out of that? Um, we got a good answer with their, their victory in Healy Park against, against Kerry. And they backed it up at the weekend, the Clonus as well. Um, just the huge contrast from the night in Castle Bar to how they were set up defensively on Sunday in Clonus. Far more organised, far more structured. Their matchups, they identified, obviously, with Monaghan. We've said this, that, that a big challenge for a team like Monaghan is, is getting enough scores, particularly with Conor McManus only kind of easing back into this season. So they're relying on Conor McCarthy and, and Jack McCarran. Tyrone detailed Parik Hampsey and Michael McCarran to pick these two guys up. And it was those two guys back to their um, challenging best. <laughs> they didn't give the boys a sniff. It worked. Shut them, shut them down completely. But just the the whole Tyrone defensive system, like it was just far more organised, far more energy in the play, far more edge in their defence. They were just hard to play against and they completely shut Monaghan down. I think Monaghan only scored it's a four or five points for play in the whole one. match. One. one. Sorry. Kieran Duffy. Kieran Duffy, point, the fullback. Kieran Duffy coming up, kicking an absolute worldly one point from play in the whole game. So straight away, there's been a massive improvement in Tyrone's energy and their attitude to defence which is what you'd associate with them. So that's a big positive for, for Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar. Up front, Darren McCurry, probably still not at his best form, but kicked a couple of lovely scores. Derek Canavan has really cemented his place. We said that at the, the outset of the National Leagues, that we felt it was time for him to really put his hands up. And he did that again at the weekend. Brilliant run and assist for Cormac Quinn's goal, which kind of, once they got a couple of goals and... Peter Hart's penalty, that was kind of, the race was run for Monaghan and obviously the sendings off didn't help them down the stretch either. But for Tyrone, they've had a big turnaround in their attitude and their offensive organisation, which was, it's very hard to be successful without either of those things. And in the last two or three weeks, they've got a really, really positive response in that regard. So that's a big plus for them, big improvement for them going into the Ulster Championship. And I think they will likely carry that on this weekend against Armagh. They have a bit of momentum. Tyrone Armagh is always a massive, massive game, hugely intense rivalry, and particularly with how you remember last year's championship game when Tyrone just did not show up in the athletic grounds and Armagh steamrolled them. Armagh are on a bit of a low ebb themselves. I've been disappointed with them throughout this National League, another probably lacklustre performance against Galway. Their chances of reaching the league final are gone. And to be honest, I expect Tyrone to carry on their form. What I've seen with them over the last couple of weeks has been far more the Tyrone DNA that we're associated with. Um, and I think they'll get a result this weekend against their man and carry that into the championship. Our man they, are in a funny place, James. They are. But they have something to play for this weekend. Like Even from listening to Kieran Donahue's interview um, about our man's performance against Galway, he was saying that it wasn't good enough that there's more in the team, there's more in the tank. And, mm. you know, it was good to hear that because sometimes you're kind of scratching your head going, what, what's wrong? But I think that he's just saying, like, we're not playing, we're not playing the same football as we were last year. Like their X factor was get it and move it with the foot and rely on good hands and good forwards inside. I think they've gone away from that completely. They're probably being, instead of being the master of one thing, that they could have gone better at with the with the long ball. I think that they're kind of being the, the jack of all trades at the moment, but they're falling short of that. You know, they're trying to maybe improve defensively, improve as a unit, but they've lost whatever they had going forward and they don't seem to be a threat at can all really do, at the moment. Can you do both? You can, you can, but I In suppose at the at the moment they're 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 becoming tighter and more defensively sound at the expense of their fundamental game plan last year, I, I think. But, but James, I, I've looked at them a couple of times. I, I just think they look flat. You know, Armand at their best, it was that all action, attack from everywhere, exciting yeah. to watch. You look at the game 
in the athletic rounds against Mayo that they kind of rescued that towards the end, but they were completely outplayed by Mayo in that game. So flat. We spoke about arguably the worst game of the whole National League against Kerry and Tralee. Mm -hmm. The same, a really flat performance, not getting big scores against Galway at the weekend. They're just, I thought Armagh's key strength was their energy all over the pitch, that they just ran at teams. I understand that as they try and progress their game plan and become a bit more savvy, particularly in the, in the bigger games, you may need to tweak certain things, but I, I just think their, their energy levels have just looked so flat throughout this entire National League. And James is right, they're, they're, they don't look great going forward. Okay, they're, they're maybe a little bit tighter at the back, but it's just not... I agree, it's refreshing to kind of hear Donaghy and come out and say that they're not anywhere near their their best. Their best, yeah. There's uh, more. You could say it's only National League, but they're playing championship in three or four weeks. Do you know what I mean? And if they're yeah. if they go to Oma and get beat again at the weekend, that's a really underwhelming. I think they'll be safe. I, I think Monaghan and, and, and Dunigal are ultimately going to go down. They'll preserve their Division One status, but that's I don't think that's a great place to be going into the Ulster Championship. Um, they'll need a big performance but for me I, I just think their, their energy across all the big games I've watched them and they've just been a little bit flat um, which is disappointing for them Do you know what what sometimes stops the flatness and Armagh were experts at this they'd score outrageously brilliant points and goals at, at big stages in the game and it would just give them that spark mm. like they'd root the ball into Reno O'Neill or to Mernon and he'd catch it and it would be in the back of the net. And suddenly there's a wave of enthusiasm throughout the team. Whereas when you're getting everybody back <laughs> and trying to carry the ball forward, there's no enthusiasm with anyone at that. Honestly, it's, it's, I just think if they reverted back a little bit to their attacking football, which I think they will come the summer, I think that, that'll, it'll, it'll add to everything else. A bit more of a balance is what you're looking for. But isn't it? We were yeah. laughing um, when we spoke about Tyrone only three weeks ago about how what, what a low place they were in. That they carry coming to town, and what what it, in a way you could say, geez, that's the last thing they need. They're playing the All Ireland Champions, but it was a brilliant game for Tyrone because it narrows the focus. It it gets the juices flowing, and for Armagh, a similar situation going to Healy Park on this weekend. That that's that could be a perfect game for Armagh mm -hmm. because of that rivalry they have with Tyrone. Because of the recent history, these two groups of players have. Look at the uh, the row, obviously, in the athletic rounds in the National League game last year, which got a hell of a lot of coverage. And then they play in the championship. And uh, I think that could be nearly the perfect game for Armagh to try and get that bit of spark back in their mm. game. So I, I'm, I won't say it looks like I'll be in Crow Park, but I'm interested to see how that game pans out because Tyrone have got a little bit, bit of momentum and are getting back towards what made them. All are the champions a couple of years ago and are really one of the top teams. And Armagh, on the other side, they're on a bit of a downward curve and they need some spark from this National League before they go into an Ulster Championship, which we said is wide open. And you have to remember, beginning has been there a long time. They've never made a dent on the Ulster Championship at all, which is the big anomaly. Mm. That they, they had a good run in the back door last year, nearly beat Galway in the quarterfinals. But surely they're looking at a wide open Ulster Championship, that's got to be a target, but I would say they will be targeting a performance to get that little bit of positivity into the, into the camp uh, this Sunday when they play Tyrone. Well, you mentioned they're in Ulster action two weeks from Sunday. So two weeks from the Tyrone game, they're playing Antrim, an Antrim team who have obviously guaranteed survival, but are going a little bit under the radar. They've lost two games in injury time to injury time goals. So Antrim have been quietly doing well under Andy McEntee. And Antrim, Armagh are on the same side of the draw as Antrim, down in Donegal and Cavan. So, depending remember, on how you're looking at it. Do you remember, was it Grogan's goal against Donegal in the qualifiers last year where Reno O'Neill caught Grogan, the, yeah. the yeah, top ball, launched it, fielded it, turned and buried it into the top corner? Ten seconds. So, if you're flat as a team and that happens, you're going, yes, we're back. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, they need a couple of those... Danny oh, he got energy from that, Jimmy. I was sitting on the couch <laughs> watching and I was like, yes, what? Yeah, I was oh. the same. I was the same. I was buzzing after seeing that. <laughs> you can imagine the, the crowd of Orange then buying into that as well and just driving them forward. But they have to go with that. I this, felt like, yeah, they were yeah. in a good place. Like, Ethan Rafferty scored a goal from play. We're not talking about this enough. Ethan Rafferty bombed in a high ball and, you know, go away defence. Gleason didn't deal with it, went straight into the back of the net. Armagh were one five to three points up at one stage in this game, in the second half. Mm -hmm. 
and they just died off. So if and they get that fair, spark back this Sunday, is that enough for you to give you a bit of, okay, they were trying something in the league, it didn't work, and it's enough now to give them a bit of momentum going into Ulster? I, I think they just need something positive from this campaign because I don't think they've got a lot of that. Yeah. You can mm-hmm. clear, it's clearly see, we, we spoke at length about their, their game in Tralee against Kerry. It, they had a very set game plan for that particular game. The National League, like I say, a lot of teams are work, trying to work on things and, and try and add layers to their game coming into the championship. And Kieran McGain is very experienced, as is Donahue, McKeever, and these guys in charge. They know that. You get the sense of that. But the way the season structured, you say championship is literally two weeks later. You want some sort of positivity in the group. Yeah. And if our man, if it's another flat performance in Healy Park at the weekend and they go in on the back of a couple of really a bad finish to the National League, that's just not the idea. We spoke about this last year, Tommy, we were talking about the league finals with Mayo. Mm. That the league just didn't finish on a good note for him and it was hard to get that bounce back. That's why for our man, if I'm in that camp, you're looking on, we're playing our nearest rivals. It's in their place. What an opportunity to grasp something really positive out of the National League, finish on a high, and then roll into that Antrim game in a couple of weeks' time. So I'm sure that's what they're targeting. Um, but, but my feedback from what I've seen on them will be just, as James is saying, that little bit more energy back into their game. That's what we, we loved watching. That's what was nearly the X factor in their team. And we haven't really seen that, I don't think, at any stage throughout this National mm-hmm. League in any of the games, which is the disappointing thing I'd say for, for Kieran McGinney's side but I, I'm looking forward to seeing at the weekend to see do they go right we need this result let's go for an 8-7 win or <laughs> we need and get everyone back and you know do the, the hardy stuff or is it a case of let's go for it let's take the game by the scruff of the neck and let's go kicking the ball again and try and score some great scores and go back to our fundamentals we had last year and then not rely almost on the result because they're safe anyway if you, you remember last year, the two the plates were on in the National League and the Athletic Rounds well, and, and, in the, and in the Championship, and they blew Tyrone away yeah. both times. Absolutely just overran them, the intensity, the speed of their play. Like Tyrone, obviously, was part of their horrendous <laughs> 2022. But our man just, their energy alone overran Tyrone. I'd love to see that approach from them at the weekend, just yeah. to get back to that. I think we all would. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they would as well. Yeah. Uh, sticking with the relegation team. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the games here and we're going to get your predictions before we move on to Division 2. Bit on Division 2, move on to, to predictions on to Division 3. So, Mayo Monaghan. Monaghan have to go to Castlebar. We know how strong Mayo are at home. We know how important home advantage is in league football. Before I ask you whether you give Monaghan any hope, I can see you shaking your heads. Mayo again. Aidan O'Shea was named man of the match. We've done loads of talking about Mayo, so just a quick word. Aidan O'Shea was man of the match. Like, Paddy Durkin, they got a proper tune out of Paddy Durkin and Matty Ruan once more. Five points from play between the two of them. The signs are good. The Mayo. signs are good. 100%. Like, every week is just solidifying what we're seeing. Yeah, they're on the crest of a wave. Like I, I fully expect them to rest a number of players the weekend because they're guaranteed the final. So I can't imagine them putting out their, their strongest team. But because they're on that, that absolute crest of a wave, I can see whoever slots in there just taking up the mantle. I expect yeah. Conroy to play and I expect him to win. And all those players, and you can imagine those players on the periphery of Max Day's first team, are crying out for a chance to prove themselves. Yeah. 100%. And there's a game in Crow Park coming up after it, which they all want to be involved in. Yeah. There's, there's a feel-good factor amongst them. I thought Aidan O'Shea was excellent at the weekend. I don't know if they'd given him man of the match. I thought Ryan O'Donoghue was excellent. Mm. I thought Maddie Ruan was brilliant in that first half as well. He seems to have gotten back to his... Um, he seems to be forcing a lot of shots. and The second outside of the boot cost him man the match. <laughs> yeah, I did. But if you've just kicked one, I could see why you went for that again. <laughs> but you remember last year, he just seemed to be trying to force things. It just wasn't happening for him. He seems to, not just himself, everyone of those Mayo players, there's a confidence about. You could see there's there's Aidan O'Shea and Paddy Durkin talking after the game. Kevin McStay, he said every time he does an interview, you know he's worked in the media. He's so infectious. He loves mm. it. There's just an energy about Mayo. I, I, I agree. I think they're going to rest players, but I think they're going to beat Monaghan. Um, I expect probably Killian O'Connor and Tommy Conroy to start. 
that's not exactly weakening the team. And um, they're probably rest the likes of Aidan O'Shea, Maddie Rowan, Dermot O'Connor. But I think we said it with Mayo, they're they have a clean bill of health, which is really important, not just for Mayo, but for all the teams. They have that at the minute, they have that bit of depth. And, and James is right. If you're getting an opportunity in this Mayo team at the weekend, you there's competition for places, and it's the best place for a manager and a team to be. Um, their style of play. I'll give you an example. Aidan O'Shea got a brilliant score. It was about 11 or 12 minutes into the game on, on, on Sunday. Dermot O'Connor wins a turnover. Or, or Mayo win a turnover inside their own 21, just around the D. Pops it out to Dermot O'Connor. 40-yard kick pass down the wing to Jack Kearney. He wins it. Turns 40-yard kick pass into Aidan O'Shea. Aidan O'Shea skins Brendan McCall and clips over a score. It was like something you'd see in the 90s. Like our man last year. Yeah, it, but it was just... It was so refreshing to see the speed of transition, the skill execution. Aidan O'Shea is confident now. We, we mm -hmm. said this. He's not a guy who's going to score seven or eight points from play, but you can see he has a clear role from McStay. He's confident in taking the ball on. He's clipping a couple of scores. He gets a couple of marks as well. It was just, it was a score that just epitomized what Mayo are trying to do, and they're doing it really well. And it's not overly complicated. Good execution everyone on the same page and just the speed of transition. And you could swap those three players out for any three players in the Mayo team. They're just moving the ball really quick. They're really direct. And there's just an energy and a feel-good factor around the team at the minute. And even with changes, I don't think Monaghan are going to have the answers to, to win that game in Castle Bar. No. It'll be a big Mayo crowd. And as good as Mayo are, I just think Monaghan, we said this from day one, they're just up against it to get scores. Mm. That's the, the reality of it. Like I said, a point from play at the weekend. McManus comes on, kicks four scores, marks and frees. He's going to be crucial for them again, but there's still that massive, massive reliance on someone like McManus. And Monaghan is, Monaghan's away for him. Like we watched them that day in, in Clarny against, uh, against Kerry. I, I just think they're up against a big time to get a result at the weekend. And I think they're going to join Donegal in Division 2, to be honest. Yeah, and just moving briefly on to Donegal vs Common, and this is a tangent. Waterford, the Waterford footballers got their first win in six hundred days at the weekend. They bet London to jump them in the table and uh, get their first win in six hundred. That's a massive thing for Waterford football. So, if Fitzgerald and the Waterford team, fair play. Waterford are the lowest scorers across the four divisions with sixty six points. Donegal are next with sixty seven points scored. They're averaging 10 points a game. Another team struggling for scores. They're essentially, they're relegated. Like they're not mm. getting the swing that's needed this weekend against Roscommon. We spoke last week about the off the field issues. And there's talk that there are going to be meetings this week in Donegal um, to do with some of the fallout from the academy. So we wait and see what happens there. Um, the Rossies have an outside shot at promotion. They kind of hope need to hope results go their way and they, they get a bit of, um, they get a bit of a, uh, yeah, a bit of luck in that regard. They flattish, so I'm going to move on now to the Kerry Gaw game. Kerry were flattish again. Was coming, was coming. Easily could have caught them late on. I thought it was a penalty from the TV. Now people in the stands are telling me that it was potentially a dive, but I thought it looked like a penalty from the TV. Kerry were probably lucky they weren't caught again. They're just there's something flat about Kerry, James. There is a bit of flatness. I mean, over in the stadium the last night. Kerry went 1-3 to no score up. They got an unbelievable goal. Tony yeah, Braston gives beautiful. a great pass to Clifford and he absolutely rifles into the far corner. And it was 1-3 and the crowd were baying for blood. They wanted yeah. Kerry to open up. But Ross Common just stuck in there and there was that kind of slow lethargic play on, on both sides, I thought again, that, that seems to just drag the pace of the game down. I think the Kerry are, are a lot better when the game is more kind of helter-skelter, they can afford to turn over the ball a bit and, and turn it back over and then they'll get, get, the, get the points needed. But I think it was a bit over and back and slowish. And eventually Ross Common just stuck in it, stuck in it. And when someone sticks in there like that, the longer it goes on, the more dangerous it becomes. And the more nervous you get, you're kind of like, these fellas aren't going away. If the ball hits the back of the net here, we're, we're in trouble. So I don't think the carrier are going to be worried. Really? Because you're saying that now for six weeks in a row. Yeah, this, I this think, is what we expected. I from think, 
Yeah, it is. Yeah, we said at the start of the year, it's not going to be their best league. But no. what Kerry have is is a a block of training camp coming up that is going. Yeah. That's going to be where okay. they can turn their season around. I mean, that's going to be the most important week of their year. Basically, sharpen up, get a bit of freshness, get a lot of football into them, redefine who they are, and just go at it again. So. How does that set up this weekend against Galway? Are Kerry going into that trying to win that game to get into a league final or will that discover their prep? I I, I think that Kerry will go and try and win it. Um, whether that means they'll win it or not. Like, I don't think they're going to go up and and, and play a weakened Thank team. Yeah. I don't think the Jack will do that. Plus, they've got a lot of injuries, you know. Ocumbar is out, Dara Roach is out. Mm. They've got a few lads coming back. So I think he'll want to get time into his best team um, because the championship is coming around fast. And it would be, if Kerry were to win, it would be a statement win away in Galway, plus with the possibility of being back in the league final. So whether That'd they... Be, whether it would they, not be interesting. Whether they win it or not, again, and we've said this week on week, it's not the end of the world for Kerry, but I think that they will go up to win that game. I, I think this league campaign has gone exactly as you were, as we predicted it would. It's one of the only predictions we got right. <laughs> Kerry's approach this nationally, that they'd win their home games they would be a little bit behind in terms of fitness and sharpness than the other teams, but Kerry had the luxury of being able to afford to do that. Yeah. yeah. The squad. Jack's got to look at a lot of players. I don't think they're going to win this game against Galway. Um, and I don't think that has a massive impact on them either. I agree. They need three, two or three weeks, maybe four weeks of solid work. And that's the luxury, I suppose, of the Munster Championship, that they're still way ahead in terms of, of the Munster Championship. They'll have a window to do that. But... I'm not surprised at all how this league has gone for Kerry and I wouldn't be overly worried if I was them either. They know they need work. They've preserved the Division 1 status as we expected that they would do. But I don't think they're going to get a result over in South Hill this weekend. Okay. It's like the third if, you week. saw, if you saw Galway's reaction to winning this weekend. Huge. Like They were really going for it. They were delighted with that win. This is a big game against Kerry for them, I think. Yeah, it is. They'll have they, targeted this like. They'll have targeted this. They want to win this, put a little bit of dent in Kerry and put themselves in the league final with a chance of a national title. If, they, if they're if they up there and they get turned over at home to Kerry, I think it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, of a downer for them. So it'll end, it'll end a good league campaign on a, on a sour note. So I think that they'll be highly motivated to win that game. Whereas I think the Kerry are going up, it's a case of we've our job done in the league almost. Yeah. Okay. Predictions for Division 1. And these could be quick. All games are at 1.45 p.m. on Sunday. In a word, go away or carry. I'll do all four at once. All home teams are going to win this weekend. Okay, so Paddy's going for Galway against Kerry. Mayo to beat Monaghan. Tyrone to beat Armagh. Where's Comedy to beat Donegal. James, are you going to counter any of them? Because I have a counter or two. Ooh. Yeah. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fancy Kerry to, to turn over Galway. Away. <laughs> you kind of saved me that one because I was thinking of it too no, I'm, I'm very 50-50 I just think I just think that is a even whatever yeah. we've just spoke about Walsh yeah. Walsh will be starting for Galway I know they're missing Comer but even just the mentality of where both teams are at I agree I don't think Jacko's going to go up and throw his arse at the game that, that's not their style but I uh, I would be uncomfortable the one I'd be worried about potentially is our match around if I'm back and turn it around, but I think the other three are not yeah. sad folks, but I'd be confident of home wins. No, I, 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 I fancy Arma, I fancy Mayo, um, I fancy Ross Common, and then I'm just having my Kerry hat on. I find it very hard to back <laughs> against Kerry. I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I, my head is saying, is saying, look, go away, have all the momentum. Do you know, Kerry don't have that as much to play for, but I'm going to go for Kerry. Okay. It would be lovely as well. A Galway Mayo League final. Because I think I have been, of all the teams and all the divisions, I've been impressed with those two teams the most. It would be brilliant to see them. There might be a bit of shadow boxing in it, but I'd love to see Galway Mayo and Crow Park on Sunday. I, I don't think yeah. Mayo would want to see Kerry coming in that league, league final. I think that would be very interesting. May I think Mayo Kerry would be more interesting. No. <laughs> given what that. we saw last yeah. year, given the given the schooling they got in Croker last year. <laughs> oh, hard on Clifford again. <laughs> You know, one on one. Tommy, go on. Who are you saying? You, you I, I'm calling. My home wins, like. I'm I'm calling Kerry and Armagh. I'm in the same boat as. Uh, oh, okay. I right. actually think I think Kerry will will turn up, and we'll uh, I think Armagh. I think Armagh need a spark. 
Uh, yeah, they've they more to play for. Paddy, yeah, you could easily have. Opinion, but you're wrong, but okay. Pat, you could easily have four from four. Division two this week to set the scene. <laughs> Derry are promoted. Limerick have been relegated. Clare have been relegated. The winner of Loudon Dublin will be promoted. Clare and Limerick is dead, Robert. Nothing on the line. The other games, though, while it may look like on paper there's nothing on the line, they do because we won't know who's going to be in the All Ireland series until the end of April when the provincial championships have been finished. The people, the the counties who finished in sixth and fifth are in definite danger of sliding into the Tajin Cup because of a division, if a division three or four team, if I can speak, reaches the Ulster final or the Munster final or even the Leinster final, uh, which can happen those positions will lose their spot in the All-Ireland series and it'll go to, to the provincial finalists. So uh, Cork need to beat Derry to guarantee their place in fourth um, and the losers of Mead and Kildare will obviously finish in sixth position. So they're in a battle, um, in a battle there. The big game is obviously loud in Dublin. The Cork Derry one is interesting to you because they are obviously through six from six. They're in the league final. I think they'll play Dublin the following week. I think Rory Gallagher might change around a couple of players. They've worked extremely hard for this league campaign. And Cork, the Cork are probably a little bit unlucky against Loud last week to send it off. And they've lost a couple of key players, the likes of Hurley and stuff. So I think Cork, depending on the lineups of those teams, might sneak a win against Derry. I'm not saying if Derry are a full strength, I, I, I think they'd comfortably beat Cork, but I just think there might be a few changes there. I agree. I, I think the big game... And one of the most interesting games outside of Dublin Loud is Mead and Kildare <laughs> in, in Newbridge. That two teams, we spoke about Kildare at length, really, really struggled through this league campaign. They get the win to kind of save themselves in the Gaelic rounds. But I think they've been unbelievably disappointed. And Mead, after the initial bounce they got for Colin O'Rourke, like their game against Dublin last Saturday was not great. <laughs> not great at all. So... A yeah. lot has been a lot has been said. Cora Staunton on the Sunday game described it as naivety. Um, mm. Stephen O'Mara, who we've mentioned on this podcast before, who's been an analyst with Galway and Donegal, savaged them um, this week in terms of their their setup and some of the stuff that's happening on a coaching level. How do you set up like that against Dublin with the wind? It was, um, I think, it was brilliant for Dublin. <laughs> we, we spoke about Dublin the week before. The issues they had against Derry with that really lateral attack, slow transitions. I think it was nearly the perfect storm that Dublin were going to come and be really direct. We've seen that with, with Conor Callahan and Killian O'Gara staying inside. And Dublin kicked more balls direct in that first half than they have in the last 12 months. I'd say so. That was the, the you could clearly see that was the attitude of Dublin to try and transition a lot quicker, which was good to see. But Mead were the perfect opponents to, to do that against. It was correspondence description naive like that's that's the only way to describe it helped by the fact that Dublin had a Gale Force win in the first half as well it was just I couldn't believe how easy Mead were making it against Dublin and then on the other side of the ball their attack we've seen this against against Derry and Owen Beg. they are struggling to, to, to play against a set defence that okay if they're wide open game we know Mead want to try and kick the ball the old traditional approach I get that. I respect that that's their, their way of playing. Very few teams play that way. But when they come up against a kind of set defence, and Dublin were really well organised defensively again, they carried that on from their, their first half performance against Derry the week before. Me just had no, they had no penetration, no one to break the line. They were poor up front, but their defensive setup, it was just it was like two on two inside the whole half, <laughs> which is just at this level. With the wind. At this level, it's just so surprising to see it, it just stood out so much because you just don't see it that much now, now you said it last week you said you believe that Dublin and Mead will have learned the most from their defeats to Derry and yeah. it looks like it looks like Mead didn't learn from the Derry game and actually they set up their structure in the second half it was too late by this stage but the structure mm. was much more probably what it should have been in the first half mm. like that's that's a worrying sign that it took that long See, sometimes against place. Dublin, you're kind of you're screwed if you do and screwed if you don't, because if, if you get too many bodies back, they'll just hand pass around you. Mm. And they'll, they'll, they'll play that slow game into the corners, back out around, pick off the shots. And if you leave it too open, they can go direct, which I, I think the Dublin need to get back to as well. That, that's, it was but, good to see from that regard, James, from Dublin's perspective. That, yeah. that, that's where it comes into an experienced team is the in-game management. That yeah. You can see, like, Maid's full back line is 
totally inexperienced. Who 21 year old and a 27 year old in this first year? And they're being left, like we always said it. If teams are going man to man, you're back in your defenders. You want to have serious defenders. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? The best in the game, man markers. Me don't have that. So you should try and protect them a little bit more. But particularly when you could see within the first five minutes, Dublin's approach to that game was they're going to start lodging the ball. They're yeah. going route one here. There needs to be a bit of in-game management here going, okay, we can kind of bring lads in a little bit tighter and try and protect our full back line. So like we said, Mead, in where they're at in their journey with Colin Moore, they're right at the beginning. There's going to be these teething issues. But they're, they're kind of, Saturday was just glaring in how naive their approach was. We know they're struggling up front to create scores against set defences. But defensively, they were just way, way, way too easy to play against. And they didn't really adapt at all either. So, Yeah. Uh, Mead obviously had, you know, a good start. They got those two early wins. And uh, that has been their saviour. Um, they could be entering a relegation battle this weekend if they hadn't got a draw against Limerick. Um, so that is where they're at. Kildare obviously got the job done that last weekend. Kildare uh, scored three goals. They had no goal score beforehand. So kudos to Kildare for finally getting a couple of goals on the board. Jack Robinson, who impressed that first night um, in against Dublin, got one of them. Derek Kerwin obviously played a big role in the other goals as well. Kevin Flynn got the first goal. And Kerwin back healed in the third. So Kildare and Mead, uh, we'll see how that goes. Do Cork and Derry... As you mentioned, their me game on it might actually be a decent game. Could be <laughs> that they're, yeah. they're quite open, both teams. That it might be um, there be goals in it. Uh, yeah, Kildare of all the teams, they might get on. They're on. They're on a hot streak in front of goal now mm. after their game in the Gaelic grounds. I think it could be quite an open game. Yeah, I'm disappointed that like when the league when the fixtures came out initially, you thought Kildare made in the final game in Newbridge could be a brilliant. Yeah. atmosphere and game we said both teams were at a really low ebb they're not a surprising thing and friend of the pod Colin Collins was on with Clare they must be kicking themselves if you yeah. look at the game the Kildare game in Ennis they oh. had that game won the Dublin game in Crow Park they had that lead coming down the stretch and they just let both of those games slip and they're relegated on the back mm. so it shows the margins in it Kildare and me can probably count themselves lucky that they're they're clear coming into the last weekend of the games where there's there's not a um, a relegation on the line, but it'll be interesting to see how that game pans out. Even though Kildare got the win against Limerick, um, it wasn't the most convincing. So yeah. interesting. I'll keep an eye on the result of Newbridge this Sunday. Yeah. Luck but has been a factor, but I'd, no. I'd say if you if you put it to Colin Collins about luck, he'd say you make your own luck. So Clare have been very unlucky. Mm. But on a positive note for them, Tam, all they have to do is win one. Are they straight into the semi-final of Munster? They're in the quarters. No, they're playing Cork in Ennis on the 9th of April. In and the, the winners of that, the winners of that play Limerick in the semi-final. Okay. They have, they to have a great off. chance to get they have a great chance to get to the Munster final and stay in Sam Maguire. Whereas like that's the thing, the beauty about the Munster Championship in a way. But like for a team who's been relegated from two, if they were from Ulster to try and get into an Ulster final is a, a, a lot more difficult challenge. That'll, so, be, I, that'll be some game in Ennis in Munster Championship, Cork and Clare. Yeah. Yeah. It would be a cracker. That would be a great game. Yeah. yeah. Um, I happened to be at the Clare Limerick game last year that went to penalties, and it was a treat to be at in the championship. <laughs> it was, it was they, Clare came out the wrong side of it, but unbelievable game. Can I, like this last question on this Mead of a fairly young team, and that's not making an excuse. Would the Tatchin Cup be a good thing for a Mead or a Clare this year? I think it'd be better for me than it would for Kildare. Yeah, not for Kildare, I don't think. Yeah. Are you talking Mead, just I, because of the profile of the squad, the, the different stage squad? Is that what you mean? But I mean, Kildare, I, I, on paper, Kildare <laughs> actually have Kildare some and Tony Gallagher are the two best teams. And Kildare, but Kildare have experience of big games, yeah. Leinster finals, you know, runs in the qualifiers, big league games in Division One. They should be at a completely different level to what they are this year. Like, this has come out of nowhere, their decline. I was expecting them to kick on and, and challenge for Division 2, but they've completely gone the other way. Whereas Mead, Mead I think the Talton Cup actually wouldn't be a bad route for Mead because when they have such youngsters learning tactically about inter-county football, a new manager, how to play together, sometimes getting a hiding sets you back a couple of months. Whereas just yeah. winning those games against teams at your level will bring you on leaps and bounds. So to trust that they're at completely different stages of their development and the journey, both those teams. Um, and for Kildare I just think that would be a massive setback mm. um, for them whereas Mead they're, like I say they're very much in its infancy under Colin O'Rourke 
lots of inexperienced players. Um, it mightn't be the worst thing. But if you ask both sets of players and both teams and their supporters, yeah. they do not want to be in the Talbot Cup. No. I think for me, that might be the worst thing if they were to go on and get a run in that. Uh, but for Kildare, just a, they're at a different stage. That would be... You don't want to see Kevin Feely, Daniel Flynn, McCormick, Kerwin. Yeah. You know, playing maybe they deserve it. There. Maybe they deserve oh, no, it. The, the, the way they play, they deserve it. But I'm saying, would it be the worst thing for them? I think it's, it will be far more of a dent for it's, Kildare than it would yeah. be. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see how Westmead go in Championship this year. They've obviously been a letdown in Division 3 where yeah, they they've let some games good. slip. So we'll see what that bounce is like um, when it comes to the Tajan Cup again this year. When did they but get are... back from that holiday? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Cool, so isn't it? let's just get the three predictions quickly for these games and we'll set the scene now for Division 3. Um, Cork and Derry, Paddy. At home, it's, it's in Parky Cueve. I think Cork might nick this one. Pe- James, James don't know who's Cork. I think Derry, based on the fact that Derry don't have a big panel, I don't think they'll rest many. I think they'll still bring a strong team. Okay. I'll go Derry. Uh, I'm going Cork. Kildare Mead. I'm going Kildare. I'm going to go Mead in this one. I think Kildare are going to beat them at home. What did you say? I you me? I'm going Mead. You both went with Mead, okay. No, I'm going to kill the hair. Oh, you went to the hair. Tommy, you went to bang in the head today. <laughs> you went to Gargan today. Like, what I may have. Story, apologies. Like? Apologies. Weekend. You're not celebrating rugby all weekend. Like. Dublin loud. <laughs> Dubs. Dublin all day. I called loud for Leinster last year, according to James. I'm going to say Dublin. Um, <laughs> moving on to Division 3 then. So uh, we'll have a breakdown of those games next week on the pod. Uh, in Division 3, what we've got is Cavan are promoted Longford have been relegated Tipperary have been relegated yep. only two teams can get promoted and that's Fermanagh or Offaly Down have just missed out by virtue of the head to head they have with Fermanagh they lost to a last minute goal um, against Fermanagh and that is the key so Offaly after an incredibly difficult week did the job with Martin yep. Murphy as, as manager stepping up after having been a selector with Liam Kearns um, so they are in with a great shout of getting promotion the way this is set up and Antrim Fair play to Antrim. They were 10 points up in Cavan at the weekend. Their uh, place in Division 3 on the line and they held them off, bet them by a point. So Cavan's momentum don't dent it a little bit. Cavan take on Fermanagh. Fermanagh need to beat Cavan and they get promoted. Fermanagh, as we mentioned, one of the stories so far under Kieran Donnelly. If they beat Cavan, they'll be promoted. If Fermanagh fail to beat Cavan, awfully need to beat down to go up. And that is the way that this is looking. So they're interesting because the span on the works of the last week is that Cavan are already promoted. Yeah. They're in the league final. Mikey Graham will probably rest a few players, similar to what they're going to have to do in Division Two. Mm. Um, like we I we didn't have Fermana coming out of this at all. I'd be fair, down or just missing out the mercurial Sean Quigley's late goal. But the job Connor Laverty has done there. Westmead have been the disappointing team. In the sure. we, we we all strongly tipped them to come up. I did have a sneaky feeling for Offaly, um, and it would be interesting to see. It was brilliant to see them get a result after an unbelievably difficult uh, week for them. Um, they could pick up a result, and for Mana, I, I think for Cameron are going to rest players. I think for Mana might get that result and get, get promoted, which would be a brilliant, brilliant result for them, yeah. um, considering where, where they came from at the start of the season. I think there's, there's nothing really in it for Kevin to like they can rest they can rest fellas be and show for mana nothing and then be ready for a league final against them mm. like that's probably the route they're going to go down I I, I agree I think for mana I would not yeah. um but Westmead just to linger on him for a second Westmead have scored 13 goals in the league and conceded one three wins and three defeats so you know, I don't know whether they've just taken the eye off the ball a little bit. Fermana got the better of them at the weekend. It looked like Westmead had reeled them back in. But they've had a couple of games in a row now under Desi Dolan where they just haven't got the job done. So they're out of the mix, down or out of the mix. Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying about Cavan Fermana this week. But again, Cavan are a month away from their 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 championship game. You know, so I'm not sure if Cavan would completely tail off here. But they've a league final team. That's it. Like, yeah, they're, they're going to put their main full focus on a league final. We've Save seen for it that. so many times in years over the National League. The last round of games and teams are already true. That is mm. when they roll out all the squad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's the same story why I think Cork will beat, beat Derry and Porky Cueve, that the focus will be on the league final the following week in Crow Park. Okay. 
Okay, so your predictions are for Mana to beat Calvin to Tui? Yeah. yeah. And in the Offaly down game? I think Offaly would probably win that one. Yeah, I, I agree. I think Offaly will take it. Okay. I, I, I think Down actually will, will beat Offaly. And uh, Calvin for Mana. I go for Mana. Yeah, I think I think for Mana will go up either way. Uh, Division four then. How we're looking. Sligo, Leitrim, Leash and Wicklow can all get promoted this week. It all hinged last week on the Leitrim Leash game in, in Park Sean McDermott. And uh, Leitrim had a huge win against Leash. I listened to this game on Ocean FM. Cracker. Commentary was brilliant. Hadn't a clue what was going on in the last couple of minutes. It was just roaring and uh, scalping. And <laughs> you didn't know which way the ball was going. But Leitrim held on and uh, they won by two in the end. So this is very simple. I'm going to lay it out to you. Sligo will be promoted if they beat Leitrim. And if Sligo beat Leitrim, Wicklow will be promoted if they beat Waterford. So that's the way it's going to work. So it's actually, we're either going to see Sligo and Wicklow go up or Leitrim and Leash go up because of the way that it'll fall. We could have four teams ending up on 10 points here, um, which means that it would go down to score difference. So if Leash beat London, if Wicklow beat Waterford, if Leitrim beat Sligo, all four teams will end up on 10 points and it'll fall down to score difference. At the minute, Leitrim's score difference is the strongest. And if those results go the way you'd expect, Leash would join them in the next best score difference. So that's the way that is. Uh, it's, a bit, look, it's a huge game, the Leitrim Sligo game again. We, I think we all agreed that they'd be, we expect both of those teams to go up from this division. Yeah. It's only got to be one of them either way. A brilliant result for, for Leitrim to beat Leash. Leash. <laughs> Uh, we gave them a load of stick well I, I gave them a load of stick at the start of the season they seem to have got a tune the first couple of games and Billy Sheehan's getting a, a bit of a bounce in them and they've just gone completely off the radar again in the last couple of weeks for them not to get promoted would be inconceivable from where you were sitting three or four weeks ago but it, it is looking that way Ushin McConville to be fair has got some brilliant results out of Wicklow which I definitely they, didn't expect. They'd be kicking themselves. They conceded a late free Ben Brosnan yeah. kicked an equaliser. They would have been up essentially like, you know, yeah, beat Waterford so and you're up. Division four, it's, like I say, it, it's unbelievably tight. I think that, that Leach from Sligo game could be a brilliant game. They had a brilliant game the Talton Cup last year yeah. all the way to Penos. Um, be great to see slightly biased Andy Moore and get, get Leach from up into Division three. Um, but it's, this is what the National League is about. The Division 4, whatever about Division 3 and 2 being a little bit more settled, but Division 4, that's a massive thing for teams to get out of that division and that progress for, for those counties. So interesting to see. If I'm looking at it, ooh, Leitrim and Leash probably, that'd be fair. to get up. It's toss of a coin, isn't it? It I is think, toss of a coin, lads. I think, like, it's not like Saigo have the edge on Leitrim, like I last know, year. That's what, but I, I'm going more the... My heart over my head for, for Leitrim to get it, get one over on Sligo. It's in. I'm just, I'm just afraid of us cursing. I'm afraid of us cursing Andy here by going, oh, Leitrim, Leitrim, Leitrim. So <laughs> maybe we'll just end the pod, will we? Yeah, so it'll be a great weekend of football. It's the best way to, to, yeah. to round that one off. But it'll, be it'll, be, it'll be huge for all those teams to get out of four and into yeah. three. And I think they'd all be fine in three. Yeah. I, yeah. I, couldn't see, I couldn't see them struggling badly in three. I, and I think for their development, Especially Leitrim, I think that if Leitrim could get out of four, I think, I think it could be the start of a nice journey for them. I think that they'd be okay in three, and they could develop, and Andy would get them going, and it would just be massive. I think mean, that's a huge game, a huge game for that Leitrim group. Just yeah. so such well, an well, important it's game. The same on Sligo side, James. With, with Tony yeah, Mark. it is. It is massive win for them as well. And there's the carrot for both of those teams of potential college final. Where you were the way the draw has gone, the championship for them as well. So I, I think there'll be a brilliant atmosphere at it. <laughs> I think it's there's so Great much game, riding yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah, it'll be good. Um, and yeah. so, yeah. at, at the minute, there are no games from Division Four that'll be televised, but all three games that matter will be on one o'clock on Sunday. I think the Carlo Wexford game, which is a dead rubber, is being played on Saturday. And likewise in Division 3, I think the Antrim Longford game, which is a dead rubber, is being played on Saturday too. So uh, it is going to be like red zone at the weekend, lads. Um, you know, have your Scorpio app out, have your GA League tables Twitter account on the go. Uh, the tables will be changing as the game goes. GA go doing it. Where can I start plugging GA go? <laughs> I think the week after, maybe, Paddy. You know, you'll be you'll be on off the ball on Sunday, I believe. So don't give away all your good stuff to Joe Malloy. 
Oh yeah, I am. I'll be on. I'll be on. Joe is back to the guy now after his rugby. Yeah, stuff. after the rugby. Yeah. So save <laughs> save some good stuff for the pod. And uh, will, myself, will. yourself, and James will be back next Monday. Thanks as always to everyone for tuning in and listening to the pod. And uh, James and Paddy, thanks very much for joining me this week. We'll talk next week. Magic. Cheers, boys. <laughs>